I'm down in Orlando, Florida today visiting a friend of mine, Pastor Ed Garvin of Calvary Assembly. And Calvary is one of the largest churches here in Central Florida and has a really rich history. Matter of fact, I served in leadership as an elder at this church for a number of years, and so it's got a, a great place in my heart. You ready? Uh, yeah. I'm in Orlando, Florida today with a friend of mine who happens to be a pastor of a fairly large church. This is Ed Garvin. Hey, it's great to be with you. And looking forward to what, uh, what we have in store for the day. <laughs> we don't have to be stiff. <laughs> I didn't really feel like I was stiff, <laughs> yeah. but that's just me. Don't, 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 look, don't, 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 don't like attack my personality. I'm not, like proje right I'm not projecting. No, I'm hurt. I'm, I'm, I'm not wounded projecting. and I don't know if I'll ever get over it. We had great tacos for lunch. Ed and I are both fish taco aficionados. I'm meeting with Ed because Ed used to be my pastor a couple of years ago. And then you abandoned us. And then I abandoned him and he keeps asking me to come Here, back. Here's, here's, what, here's what you need to know. You need to know this, that uh, Dave was part of a group um, that, that approached me and asked me if I would consider coming to Orlando and serving as their pastor. And so uh, after some time, I agreed to do so. And then once I agreed to do so, Dave said, hey, I bailed out. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> So, I got him in. I yeah. got him in place, and then I hit the yeah. road. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, man. No problem. I'm grateful. <laughs> well, it's been awesome to be here because um, I haven't met. We we haven't hooked up for a long time. I, actually, we haven't even seen each other since I left Orlando, it's, right? And it really, it's all on you because I've reached out to you numerous times, and uh, he you've... he has. It's my bad because I actually promised to make fish tacos for you guys three years ago, and I have not made good on that. How, right. However. However, I did run a 5K, and you were supposed to make good on a surfing uh, a surfing bet with me, and you have not done that yet. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you better props. Okay. Okay. You did not run a 5K. What? You ran a 10K. A 10K. That's right. You ran a 10K. 10K. Yes, you did. You ran a 10K, and and I don't know if I've ever been around somebody more bitter in my life. <laughs> I was man. I was so hacked off. <laughs> I wanted to kill you. Well, and, and here was so here was here was the agreement that he he would run a 10k with me and I would go surfing with him. And when he got to the finish line, he looked at me and he said, "Dude, I'm going to take you to the most shark infested <laughs> waters on the planet." I did. <laughs> And I will. I will. When you make good on that bet, I am totally taking you to the sharkiest hole in all of Florida. All right. <laughs> I can't do it. But see, I can't do it because I have a heart and you don't have an eardrum. <laughs> That's right? true. That's right. And so, I don't know. I just, I feel bad about that. As much as I want to hold you to it, I just have this issue with it. I appreciate the fact that you do not want to uh, see my death. That's that's just really encouraging. I'm not me. worried about the sharks. I'm worried about the water in your brain. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that is a legitimate concern. <laughs> it seriously is. That's a legitimate concern. So thanks so much. Well, we might could stick some wax or something in there. I don't know. We're, uh, you know what? Here, here's what we're gonna do. From this point forward, we're just gonna release it. I, I've already released it, so I'm good. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't carry it. You never expected to make good on it, did you? No, I did, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So that was a different season. It, it was many different seasons ago. There you go. Yeah, it's quite a few seasons that passed. So here's then. here's the thing: if you'll run another 10k, <laughs> screw that. All right, just checking. I I I swore to you that day I would never run another race. Uh, that is true. And you know, I sit here super chubby still. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we're going to move on. So I actually called up Ed yesterday. I texted him and asked if I could meet with him because there's been something that's been kind of waging this war in my heart, which is about kind of the condition of the church and really the condition of ministry in general, just Christian ministry and the way we, the way we work together or, or maybe even more so the way we don't work together. And for, the, for many years, I started this journey that I'm on 11 years ago. Actually, October next month will be 11 years that I started doing action sports ministry. And one of the challenges that I had is, I, aside from a, a handful of people, I never had anybody that was willing to come alongside me 
and to help me, to give me advice and to train me and to answer my questions. I had to figure out a lot of stuff on my own. And I don't want you guys to have to do that. That's the whole reason why I started Impact Ministry Alliance, because I want to create a resource pool. I don't have the answers for everything, but many of us, if we come together, we do have answers collectively that we can share. Right? But when I, when I reached out to Ed, I did that specifically because I wanted, I wanted him to kind of share from his perspective as a pastor of a fairly large church here in Orlando, what he sees as the current condition of the church. Where are we today? And I'm not talking about church like in a building. Many, many people think of the church as like a property, you know, a place where people come. But, but we are the church, yeah. right? You and I are the church. And I, I want to talk about the condition of us. Right, the big C church, that's kind of a Christianism that we say. But just where are we at and where are we going? From your perspective, man, being being a pastor here, what do you see and, and kind of tell us a story about where you think we might be going? So I, I think that the church is in a fascinating place. Uh, and I think that I think that history will look back on this period of time for the church and will look back on it incredibly favorably. It's interesting if you if you look at some of the stuff that's um, it's kind of in the press even recently. Uh, there's uh, different different articles, different writings on uh, the fact that the that the church is experiencing declining attendance in America for the first time in its in its history in the U.S. and and uh, there are some that forecast significant doom and gloom that. Um, that we're losing uh, the millennial generation, and 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 you know, there, there, anyway, there, there's this there's this this commentary that's out there uh, that is critical, and um, I, a couple of observations. Number one is this: is um, this is not the first time that the church has had negative press. If you if you go back and you know, all the way back to the first century. They're, they're just these cycles, right? These ebb and flows, and, and the demise of the church has been predicted over and over again. And yet, um, what, what Jesus said when Jesus said, uh, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that word still holds true. And so, uh, so the, the church is, is actually, it's in a, I believe this, it's in a good place. I believe that we are going through a, a period of time that will, um, should, should God... Uh, Terry and and Jesus re return uh, for a prolonged period of time that a uh, history will look back on this period in the church history uh, and it will have much of the same type of thought as uh, the Reformation that happened in the time of Martin Luther because here's what's happening is the church is going from being this cultural entity a, a lot of cultural Christianity is falling by the wayside uh, and, and the thing about it is much of much of what cultural Christianity is is the stuff about church that makes us feel uncomfortable anyway. Yeah, right on. And and so the the we the, talked about being moral police. That's right. So so the church the church has embraced this issue of being the morality police, um, being a uh, being a a, sub, a substantial voting block for a particular party, uh, and and the and what has happened is this is. Is the church has the church has followed uh, much more closely with a moral compass, uh, and has really drifted away from this issue of a spiritual compass. Yeah. Uh, and as we as we shift more to that spiritual compass, what happens is uh, we become much more vibrant uh, and much more true to really the heartbeat and the mission of God, and uh, what makes church kind of exciting and fun. You know what's cool? What I love about hanging out with you, Ed, is that you and I couldn't be more different. You love golf. I love surfing and skateboarding. You wear golf shirts. I wear t-shirts. Um, but we have the same dad. Yeah. And we see the world through the same lens of Jesus. Yeah. And you were sharing a story just before we started filming this about, you know, we were talking just about Christian culture in general. Yeah. And you were sharing a story that, to me, connected so much with the realm of action sports ministry or in the trenches kind of ministry about a dude that showed up. Can you share that with us? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So actually, I posted this on social media not not, not that long ago. That um, we've got this we've got this guy in our church. There's a homeless guy, 
uh, and had a monumental event happen. He he got his he got he got documented, and got his driver's license. And in fact, if, if you were to if you were to look the address on his driver's license, it's it's the church address because because uh, he still deals with the issues of of homelessness and and navigates through that. Uh, and that's kind of a there's kind of a fascinating uh, um, side story to that. Um, but uh, but Damien his name's Damien and Damien is a guy that a couple years ago when he first uh, started hanging out at Calvary, uh, he came as a result of a initiative that we do to feed the homeless. So he would show up you know, from time to time looking for food. Right. And uh, we, we had a, a, a renovation project that we were working on. We were working on uh, remodeling our children's area and we had to rip out the stage. We we're gonna rip out the stage and put in a new stage. And so we needed some extra hands. And so we said to these guys that came and uh, came for food, said, hey, no pressure, but if anybody would like to volunteer and help with this project, and Damien was quick to say, I'll do it. So we're working, right? And uh, and slowly but surely, I let Damien use more of the power tools because it was pretty obvious that he had a proficiency with it and then he wasn't going to hurt himself or hurt somebody else. And, and as we're working along, I said to him, I said, Damien, I said, you are a phenomenal worker. I said, I don't understand with your skill set why you aren't gainfully employed. And he said, well, he said, um, Pastor, I'll tell you a couple things. He says, number one, I'm a better volunteer than I'm an employee because I goes, I have a real problem with authority. So for you to ask me to do something, I just love to do it. But if you're my boss and you told me to do something, it's not going to go well. <laughs> right. and, he, and then he said, he goes, and the other thing is this, he goes, I really like to smoke weed. And right. he said, if I had a choice between having a job or smoking weed, I'd rather smoke weed. And so it's just having the job just thing doesn't work out for me. And I said, I, I get that. I said, uh, but I told him this. I said, I said, Damien, I want you to know that if there's ever a point in your life um, where uh, where you're looking to shift that, man, I'm in your corner because I'm I'm not just your friend. I'm also a fan. And so he would drift in, drift out. And then uh, and then he started drifting in a lot more. He started hanging out. And one day he said to me, he said, I want to volunteer for anything that I can around Calvary because I want to be around you. I want to be around this type of people. I just I, I, I feel better when I'm around you. And uh, and so Damien uh, started hanging out. And I said to him, I said, I said, Damien, I said, if we can get you documented, because he was undocumented, didn't have a social security card. Right. I said, if we can get you documented, I said, I, I can't, I can't hire you uh, without proper documentation. But if we can get you documented, I would, I would love, man, I'd love for you to join our team. And now the guy works for you. Oh, it gets better. So, so he <laughs> works, he, we, we help get his documentation and, uh, and he comes in the, into a meeting we were having um, about a week before he was going to actually be able to be employed. And he's, he's, he's teary eyed. And he said this to me, he said, pastor, I'm so excited that I'm going to have a job. And he said, you know what I'm most excited about? And I thought he was going to say, you know, I can get a car. I can get a place to live. I can get it. Here's what he said. Tears streaming down his face. He goes, I'm finally going to be able to pay child support. Wow. And I'm telling you that. That just, it, it, it gripped me, right? And um, so, um, but Damien is the type of guy, so he serves on our staff, he, he, he's, he does landscaping and maintenance, and uh, Damien is still the type of guy that um, if, if, if you're on campus, and maybe he sees you like dropping a, a candy wrapper out on the grounds and that's his responsibility. He's probably going to cuss you out. Pretty good chance he'll drop an F-bomb or two. Uh, and he'll have, he'll have on the Calvary shirt, right? Now, you yeah. know this because you serve in leadership of this church. Right, right. That for most of this church's history, that guy, the first time, you know, that he, you know, goes on a profanity to lace tirade to somebody who's dropped drops candy bar wrapper, he'd have been fired in a heartbeat. Because right. we can't have that. We can't have <laughs> right. we can't have the church being represented that way. Right. But you know what we've discovered? We've discovered that life is messy and the church is messy, and we're pretty comfortable with that. And so yeah. we know this. We know that we know that Damien is gonna cuss out the occasional person. <laughs> Uh, but we also you deserved it though if you did it. Oh, absolutely! If you, you dropped a candy freaking wrapper, scumbag, you have the f bomb dropped on you. But um, <laughs> well, maybe not so much. You might even get that from Pastor Ed. Yeah. So <laughs> moving on. So, but here, here's the thing: we see this, we see this spiritual journey that Damien's on, and uh, I see him stopping and praying with people. Right on. Right. Uh, I see him make his way to the altar on Sunday morning. 
um, I, I see even his his countenance changed. Mm. And and here's what the church is what the church is supposed to be. The church is not supposed to be uh, the morality agent uh, in our world. We're supposed to be uh, a redemption center. Right on. And so uh, when we when we when we step aside from worrying about our image, uh, and really instead think about our mission, I, I think that's when uh, uh, lots of stories like Damien happen, uh, and and the church becomes the dynamic force in our culture that it's supposed to be. And, and, and can I say something? I think it's happening more in the church than what we realize, and I think it's gaining momentum. And that's the reason why you asked me what my opinion of the state of the church is. Uh, I could not be more excited about what's happening uh, in the church, in America, and around the world. There's never been a time, worldwide, there's never been a time that the church is growing faster than what it's growing right now. Right on. And I'm glad to be a part of it. You know what's cool about that story that he shared about Damien is that it's such a reflection of what we see in the skate park. You know, we could go out and we could be the moral police in the skate park, right? And there could be dudes there smoking weed. There could be guys there, you know, using profanity and doing all kinds of nefarious things, right? Things that we would look at as pretty unsavory. And we can go in there and we can wave our Bibles and we can yell at them, hey, stop your cussing and, and stop smoking weed here. This is a public facility or whatever. But how effective are we going to be? And then we were talking at lunch and I was talking about how even recently I've had to examine the pattern of Jesus and the way Jesus lived his life and the way Jesus reacted around people that the church would say is unsavory right? The things that he did. And Jesus gave us this beautiful pattern of relationship and how he would, he would be in their midst, even in the midst of things that we as the church today with our moral compass would, you know, berate people for them. Yeah. What's cool about Damien's story that I love is that you never heard Ed talk about this guy having a weed problem. It wasn't about that. It was about connecting him with a real relationship with Jesus. And if that's something that Jesus wants to resolve in his life, Jesus is going to resolve that in his life. Yeah. But this guy's showing up, and you, you can physically see the difference in him. And the same thing happens for us, guys. When we go out there and we do our best to live our lives like Jesus provided his example, if that's what we do, we're going to be so much more effective it's not about, it's not my job to go out there and make sure somebody's not smoking weed at the skate park. Do I like it? No, I hate it. But you know what? If I can somehow strike up a relationship with that guy and somehow let the reflection of Jesus in me have influence in his life, dude, that stuff can change the world. Yeah. So that's pretty rad, man. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think that's the key. Uh, oftentimes... Oftentimes, our, our moral indignation um, is, is much more about how being connected to somebody who's engaging in that type of behavior, um, how it might influence someone's perception of us. I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've been 30 years in ministry. That's uh, because I started really, really young. But uh, I've been 30 years in ministry, and I cannot tell you how many times I've heard it said, what will people think? Right? What what will people think? And and we have to be honest at how much the issue of other people's perception uh, affects our disposition towards towards people who are at a different place in their spiritual journey. And and when we when when we when we step aside from that, right? And and you talk about the Jesus model. Jesus consistently put himself in situations where it caused other people to question, yeah, right. His his maturity, his religious his religious stature, his whatever, um, and and history recounts it specifically as the religious people that were yeah. questioning him. And and he was fine with that. Right. He, he didn't he didn't make a big deal of it. Right. Because his goal wasn't to tick off the religious. And if we're not careful, we can we can have our goal be that we're um, that we are counterculture. Uh, right. And our goal shouldn't be to be counterculture. Our goal should be 
uh, to be kingdom effective. Right. And if kingdom effectiveness puts us right in the center of culture, great. If kingdom effectiveness means that we have to run tangent or even counter to culture, then we just we've got to make sure that that's it's kingdom effectiveness is what we're doing. You know, for me, perception has never been an issue. I've never really cared what people think about me. But maybe there's some of you out there who who are deeply concerned about what people might think or what people might see you doing and then you know maybe that paints some kind of negative image on you i want to challenge you specifically to go out and just be jesus regardless of your environment you know whether you're serving in a church whether you're a pastor whether you're a skate park pastor you're a you're whatever it is that you do whatever journey or mission god has got you on all, all you really need to do is just go be jesus just go help people to find relationship with their creator and if you do that, and you do it without an agenda, just to go out there because this thing that's happened inside of you, this, this life that Jesus has birthed inside of you, if you go out there in a, in a genuine nature and you go do that, people will see it. Yeah. Just like Damien saw it in the way you, you reacted or the way you behaved with him. Yeah. And, and, and when it's all said and done, it really does work. So my, my, my journey has been different than yours. Um, I, uh, and a lot of it was just, uh, the, the consequences of growing up in a, in a massively dysfunctional home. And you know, my story, my dad died when I was, right. when I was a little guy and, and all of that. Um, so, so I, um, I for a long time was really caught in this trap of approval, uh, and, uh, and chased after accolades in high school, um, um, chased after accolades in the business sector and, and even chased after accolades uh, transitioning from business sector into ministry. You know, I, I mean, I wanted to pastor the biggest youth group. I wanted to be uh, known on a, on a large stage and, and you know, have you know, um, national uh, prominence. And um, you, you reach a point, hopefully, you reach a point in this patient process that God has you on uh, where you come to the realization that really isn't all that it's cracked up to be and that isn't really where it's at. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it's all about where you are honestly in your encounter and connection and ongoing relationship with God. And, and then um, and then how, the, how your life intersects with other people uh, and their journey and being a, a friend to them and helping them uh, in their journey towards all that God has for them. Right on. Uh, and when you reach that point where you're not so concerned about what people think and you can just breathe uh, and be real, uh, that's when you become fully alive. When the church collectively does that, that's when the church becomes fully alive. And and I think that's the I think that's the new era that the church is stepping into. And right that, on. And that's why I'm excited. Right on. Just being real. Yeah. Putting aside everything that we think about who we're supposed to be and just being who Jesus has made us to be. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Dude, I thank, I, I thank you so much. You, you moved down here. You brought your family down from Illinois. And you came and took over a church. And you've done an awesome thing here, man. And I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being my friend. And I will make good on my fish taco promise. I'm going to hold you to it. I hope that this spoke to you in some kind of a powerful way. Please feel free to reach out to me. You can DM me on Instagram. You can comment on this video. Uh, please share this because I think as a culture, as a Christian culture, we've got to move beyond this paradigm of who the church is and just move into a place where we're just being Jesus and living life and loving people. Yeah. Love you guys. God bless. Take care. Bye. See you.